Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to you. My name is Richard Orm from the DAISY Consortium and I'm your host for today's webinar, The Art and Science of Describing Images, Part 2. Whether we're creating accessible documents, adapted learning materials or posting to social media, we need to know about describing images. It's a skill applicable across many job roles and there's always more to learn. In our webinar, The Art and Science of Describing Images, our presenters introduce four golden editing tips to help you craft effective descriptions. And they brought these to life by exploring examples of popular image types from Shakespeare to pancakes via Fedri Mercury. And in part two, our experts will dig deeper, covering techniques for complex images, tables, charts, infographics and maps. It sounds fascinating, so let's get started. And at this point, I'll hand over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Thank you, Richard. Hi, this is Valerie Morrison, and I work at the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, Georgia. And I manage the eText department, and we basically focus on converting textbooks and course materials into accessible file formats for students with a wide range of print related disabilities, learning disabilities, or just individuals who access material using assistive technology. Thanks so much, Valerie. Um, I'm Hugh Alexander. I'm um, the director of the Textbox, and we're focused on um, providing image description services uh, for the publishing industry and media in general. So uh, hopefully we can share some, some tips with you today. And it's lovely to be back in tandem with Valerie after our first session. Um, I'm trying to move on the slide and it's not quite working. So just one second, there we go. Um, as, as Richard said, um, this is the second part in a proposed trilogy. So you could say this is the Empire Strikes Back of, of image description. Hopefully I'll find out who my father is at the end of it. Um, but as an overview, we're gonna talk about um, the information and, and, and complex images, um, how information is conveyed now. Um, we're gonna talk through some, uh, describing some complex images with some examples. Um, we're also going to be talking about um, complex images and how, how you can simplify them, how you can break them down into uh, their constituent parts just to, to make it a, an easier job to describe and an easier job to, to follow the information being conveyed. Um, and at the end, we're going to be taking questions. So uh, please, uh, as, as Richard said, uh, add your questions uh, to the Q&A um, box as, as we go along and we'll be happy to, to answer those. As we all know, especially this year, um, the world is a complex place um, in a variety of ways, um, and none more so than in the kind of digital space. It's become such an important area with uh, digital learning, with everyone um, accessing material, especially colleges from home, um, and making sure that, that that content is as accessible as possible. But what has happened, um, not just this year, but in, in the, the last decade or so, there's been a real change in pedagogy, the way that um, the, the information is conveyed to students. Educational materials have shifted to a much more um, visual form of conveying information. If you look at a textbook now and compare it to say 10, 15 years ago, it was much more text-based then, but now um, students are expecting and getting uh, really fantastic uh, textbooks coming through full of infographics, other graphic images, of ways of, of conveying that information in, in, a, in a consumable way. Um, and that's because students are demanding it. Students are, are, are wanting to learn in, in different ways. And you can see that in, in the kind of um, the consumption of things like YouTube videos and the way um, th uh, learning and education is portrayed through video but also through textbooks as well so we're trying to to help um, with that because otherwise um, there is a certain amount of content in there a huge amount of content that is not being conveyed to the actual user so uh, a visually impaired reader is going to be missing out on so much great stuff uh, for instance when you've got a, a chapter and you've got a, a, a infographic at the end that explains everything that you should have learned in that chapter if 
the alt text and image description just says image 31, it's not very useful to, to the visually impaired reader. So they're missing out. It's almost like the book has been censored. So hopefully what we're going to be talking about today will help you in describing those kind of complex images. And we're talking about things like maps, um, infographics, um, chloroplast um, diagrams, anything like that. Uh, we'll take you through, walk you through examples, and hopefully take away that confusion so you can move um, from A to B very quickly in, in that kind of description and, and create a description that is immersive and, and mainly useful so that the students aren't missing out on that really fantastic work that publishers are doing now uh, in, in creating information in a, in a very visual way. So I'll hand over to Valerie who will be talking talking you through some examples. I'm in control of the slide still so it's my fault if anything goes wrong so uh, over to you Valerie. <laughs> Thank you Hugh, I appreciate that. Um, right, if I mess up I'm just going to say that it was all you. That's, yes, absolutely. It's very Instead. comforting. <laughs> um, so I am going to run through a few complex examples of different image types to tell you how I approach them. Um, and please bear in mind that I have several years of experience in focusing mainly on writing alt text and how to describe and and you know, tear content out of the visual space and into a more accessible text space. Um, and I still find a lot of the images that I'm going to use as examples today, I find them daunting. So um, really don't, don't think that um, this is beyond you because we're just going to show you some examples and how we approach them so that you can feel more confident and more capable in doing this yourself. So the first type of image I wanna look at is a map. And this, is, this has a lot of information in it, this map, right? There's a great inset that shows you um, different um, types of information that are um, marked on the map, like coal fields, industrial areas, ports, steelworks, oil wells. There's a lot indicated on this map. Um, how I approach writing a map, and I think that um, there are all types of different approaches, but how I approach it is I'm always going to want to start with a very general overview sentence that sums up what is in the map. So if the map, if the figure that you're describing doesn't have a caption that precedes it um, or a title, then I am going to have a general overview sentence that's, uh, for example, here I would say a map of Europe titled areas of industrial concentration from the years 1870 to 1914, period. And then I might list using the inset as my guide, sort of as my table of contents of the map, I will focus on that inset and figure out what relevant details I want to focus on. I won't list every single country unless the context demands that I do. I'll just talk about the area indicated on the map in a general way and then fill in details from general disposition general to specific as I go and as needed, depending on my context. I might even, um, if I have space or the ability, I would maybe create a list separate from the map. So I might have my alt text be very general to describe the map in a brief way. And then if I could insert a list after the figure, of the different coal fields where they are, list the industrial areas or the cities with high population counts um, to offer that information in a different modality. And something that I think Hugh is gonna focus on later or I've, I've noticed looking at his slides, he's got a lot of um, very long um, alt text descriptions because some of these demand that you really go into detail. Um, but if you are forcing someone to listen to that long description in alt text format, they don't have the ability to pause, go back, rewind. They kind of have to listen to the alt text field in one shot. And so if you can take things out of the alt text and provide a separate table or list, that might be another modality, another accessible 
solution for you. So when I'm approaching a map, again, general overview sentence, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention is you don't really need to focus too much on the colors of a map, what colors a country are shaded, uh, you know, these purple diagonal bits. You, you don't have to say purple diagonal anywhere in your alt text description. Um, they often have the symbols or the colors often have no significance and you could just focus on the meaning instead of the appearance of symbols. Next slide, please. All right, so here is a very, very complex infographic um, with a timeline and a little essay over to the left and images and description of those images. This is a lot. And this is one of those end of chapter, here's everything that you need to know situations that Hugh was describing. So again, for this instance, I'm going to use my tried and true approach, which is create one general overview sentence where I describe if there's a title, I'm going to talk about the title of the infographic, top, talk about it as a timeline, and then indicate um, the type of events listed on that timeline. So sometimes you'll see, um, you know, it focuses on, here we're focusing on events and people important to Black history, and then I'll list the range of dates that the timeline covers. So that's a very brief description for all of this info. Um, one way, if you wanted to translate all of this visual data from this image into text format, a great way to do that would just to be creating a list and you could list the events by date or you could create a numbered list if there aren't actual dates indicated if it's just maybe eras you could have a numbered list and list all of the events um, indicated on the timeline next slide please so for bar charts, this is a very simple looking bar chart um, and there are all kinds of bar charts. There's a, quite a range, um, line graphs, bar graphs, pie charts, all of them um, you approach, uh, I approach the same way. I begin with a title if there is one. If there's not, I'm just going to name what type of graph it is, a bar chart um, titled, in this case, maternal mortality in selected states. And yikes, I am in Georgia. And this map indicates that Georgia has a very, very high maternal mortality rate. Uh, in fact, it's more than double any of the other states. I also noticed that not all of the states are listed. And so from looking at this, I want to pay um, tribute to the fact that this was prob this graph was probably created to make a visual impact, right? Um, the different numbers are arranged in a way that um, the they're arranged in descending order, and the highest rate is more than double any of the other states. And so, in my alt text description, I'm going to want to step back and pay tribute to that and mention that for people who cannot see the visual um, impact of this graph. So often when people are translating data into graph format, they're doing it with, uh, they're doing it to highlight a particular idea or piece of data. Um, so my general approach to a bar graph is going to be mentioning the title, describe what is on the X and Y axes, if I'm in a humanities context, I might call them vertical and horizontal and not X and Y because I still forget sometimes which one's which. Um, but if I'm in STEM, I'm definitely calling them X and Y axes. And then I will describe each bar in very regular predictable ways so that it's very easy for the person listening to follow. And then um, again, always stepping back. And sometimes a graph is just a graph. 
right? But in this case, I think there's definitely a visual impact the way it's been arranged and the way that only certain states have been selected. So I'm going to want to mention that probably before I list all the data points, if I'm going to go into specific detail, I want to mention that before rather than later. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the kind of graphic that I really dread. Um, this is a, a supply and demand curve. And once um, you have one, always copy and paste it into a document so you could save it for later and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, but it looks daunting, but again, it's just a graph, right? So I'm going to approach this by creating that overview sentence where I mention what type of graph it is, that it's a supply demand curve or a line graph with price on the vertical axis or on the Y axis, yes, and quantity on the X axis. And then I'll describe the slopes or lines on the graph and then note where these lines intersect at what points, right? So it looks very complicated. It looks like you could kind of get lost in a lot of um, word salad or letter salad with D, S1, S2, P1, P2. There's lots, lots of information here, um, but it really can be much more simple, right? A supply and demand curve with quantity on the x-axis, excuse me, and price on the y-axis two parallel positively sloped curves are intersected by a negatively sloped curve. And you could name them and get specific about the points. Um, so I have a very regular way in which I describe these. Next slide, please. Okay, this is um, a very, I would say, very beautiful, this is subjective because I love dinosaurs. Uh, this is a very beautiful infographic, but very complex, right? Um, it has a lot of information on it. It is, uh, you've got a timeline down at the bottom that is shaded different colors to represent different eras. And then above, there's a circle um, and at the center is the earliest era. And then as we move outward to the edge of the circle, the outer ring is the later eras. And superimposed on top of that time wheel, I guess, is a phylogenetic tree showing dinosaur evolution. So as we progress out towards the outer ring of the circle, dinosaurs are evolving later and later and later and getting more and more awesome, I guess. Uh, so I'm going to try and approach this the way I approach all my infographics, all my complex alt text, that one sentence that sums up everything and provides a framework for the person listening with screen reading software. So I'm going to say a complex infographic. This was titled Dinosaur Evolution. And then list all the parts, right? A uh, that includes a timeline of eras ranging from this date to that date um, with a phylogenetic tree and illustrations of dinosaurs. Um, and then work from general to spe specific from there, filling in details as needed depending on the context. I It would be difficult to describe the appearance and an anatomy and structures of every single dinosaur on this graphic. Um, so I might just sum things up in one brief way saying, you know, the dinosaurs appear smaller and less complex at um, in the center at the earliest. And then as they evolve, they get larger with more um, spikes or I'm not a dinosaur expert. I should be the way I love them so. All right, next slide, please. Okay, great. This is a complex infographic that describes different cloud formations and has illustrations and then arranges the illustrations based on their elevation, the different cloud types and their elevation. Um, 
The way that this is arranged as an infographic, it allows a sighted user to just at a glance, they can see all of these different cloud types grouped together. Um, if we wrote alt text for this, it, you'd kind of lose that ability to compare. Um, if we wrote it all out in a long paragraph describing each of the cloud types and what they look like and their elevation, it might be it might get lost to the grouping ability. And so this is an example of an infographic that I would argue could function very well as a table. If you had a table where you mentioned, you know, the cloud name, the cloud description, and then the ele elevation, and then maybe the appearance as your column headings along the top, then you could have a table where you describe each cloud type and all of that information and someone would be able to compare it and go back and tab through the table and it might be easier for someone to um, kind of absorb that information in table form. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a complex STEM infographic about genetic code. And I would argue that this is hard to parse, even for a sighted individual who aced all of her science in college. This is difficult. This is a lot of information coming at you in wheel form. Um, it's kind of angry, too. There's a lot of capital letters, a lot of bold a lot of uh, repetitive letters that kind of look the same. C and G look very similar. Um, so for someone who had dyslexia or someone who just didn't want to be shouted at by a lot of capital letters, uh, this is hard to absorb again. So um, converting into a table with very specific column headers might be more accessible for more individuals. Granted, someone has gone to a lot of trouble to create this graphic and visual learners might glean information or see groupings or see connections in the visual format, which is wonderful and amazing. Um, but a lot of people will have difficulty accessing this. So if you, if you, you could advance to the next slide. Uh, this is the same information translated into a table. So if you could, the goal is, you know, if you could provide multiple modalities for your learner, it will be accessible to more people. You could have the visual and the non-visual, the text form in accessible table form. So here we have a table with three columns. The column headings are amino acid, symbol, and DNA codons. And providing this data in table form would allow someone to tab through each uh, cell or each column um, in order to access all that information. In addition, I would recommend um, if you do create a table that you have a title for your table or and or a caption to briefly describe what's going to come in that type table what the um the data is what it's what the table concerns so that someone listening with assistive technology can decide whether or not they want to enter into the table to read it they could even they could skip it if they wanted to if they read the caption or a title next slide please all right, and I just want to finish up by talking about um, structural alt text for tables. So in this specific example of uh, a, a table, we have a table titled Physical Properties of the Giant Planets. And it doesn't have a column heading in that very first column. I think it wants you to just assume that you know what those all are, what groups them together. Um, it And really what that first column is about is physical properties, right? So it's in the, it's in the title, but I think to make it more accessible, it should be repeated in the actual table itself. So we have physical properties and then the four giant planets and their different 
um, data points for each physical property. So if this were in accessible, this obviously on the slide is an image of a table, but if you turned it into an accessible table, I would recommend creating alt text for your table. That is a thing that you can do in PowerPoint or in Word. You can right click on a table just as if you would be right clicking on an image to edit the alt text. You can add alt text to your table. And what we do is we create what we call structural alt text where we just talk about how the table is structured. So my example here is uh, table 10.1 is titled Physical Properties of the Giant Planets. It has five columns and 13 rows. The column headings are Physical Property, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And in that way, I am giving someone um, that overview of the table so they know um, they have a framework before they start hearing all these numbers being launched at them. They know the general layout of the table. They understand and can get, can get kind of a mental map of how the table is arranged before they start listening to it. And so that's not always um, a possibility. Sometimes you're dealing with pictures of tables, but I would recommend that um, your tables should have a title and a caption and alt text to be 100% accessible. And so next slide, please. I'm going to um, hand things over to Hugh, although I don't know if we wanted to pause for questions. We could at this time, or if Hugh, you wanna just describe your infographics for us. Um, so uh, it would be great if we could take a couple of questions at this point in time, Valerie, so we okay. don't have to hold them all to the uh, end. And Hugh, you're in control of the deck. Maybe you'd take us back to the bar chart example while I ask Valerie uh, the question from Oscar. Thank you for your question, Oscar. Um, Valerie Oscar says, you mentioned that a reader can't rewind, fast forward or pause the alt text. Is that a general rule or is it based on what program or technology they're using? It is a general rule. So I am, use, I am using JAWS and NVDA to test um, the files that we make accessible. And so based on the default settings, um, you just hear the alt text all in one shot and you can't pause it. If you want, you have to listen to the entire description over again. Now that of course is dependent on the, the version of the software that someone's using or the settings that someone has. There, there are lots of people who um, can get into JAWS and find specific settings to um, get around that, but the default settings, you hear it all in one shot. Great. And the question specifically on this bar chart example comes from Jessica, who says that for this bar chart example, it's hard to be specific about the data points because there's a, a range, if we've got the right one, uh, of 10 between each label on the x-axis. Maybe it was a different uh, bar chart. No, this, so, this is correct. Okay. So if you're giving data per state, what would your approach be? Would it be to say that Georgia has approximately 27 or how would you kind of represent that when maybe the number itself isn't so clear to you? So I would, um, I would not want to say approximately every single time because it could get redundant and it's a long word to type out each time, honestly. So I would probably say, um, you know, the following data points are approximations and then list them all, right? And then do my best to line up a piece of paper or something and say, and list them, Georgia 46, Iowa 18, Kansas 18, Utah 17, so that um, I'm not saying approximately and over and over again, I would just say it once and then list the data points. That's very clear. Thank you for that. Hugh, you have the con uh, and you're picking up, I think, from the slide to do with uh, complex images. Infographics. So, infographics. Just, just a quick point on, on bar, graph, bar charts and bar graphs and things. And um, I've been doing 
hundreds of these over the last couple of months. Um, and the best thing that publishers could do is, is provide data points because it's so, so um, valuable to everyone, to sighted readers as well. It's because as, as kind of one of the listeners has said, like, a lot of that is very, very similar. And it's great, you can, you can say, oh, these are estimated data points. Um, but I spent so much time recently going back and trying to find the actual data, going through census um, websites and things like that, to find this information so that you can actually build the table. Um, it's absolutely valuable content so for everyone. So if, if publishers are thinking about um, data points, it, it just makes it a lot clearer to provide these tables as well as, as part of the book. Um, ooh, skip past my my bit. I was I was just thinking then um, about how how this might be quite daunting for the audience because these are these are complex um, complex images um, and it's and it's okay not to get this right the first time you're writing a description. Um, as the great Terry Pratchett said, um, you're you're telling yourself the story. The first draft of you writing a description or a story is you telling yourself the story. You're taking all the data points and information from that image, collecting them in, and, and organizing that into a description. Um, you can edit it. You, you're not doing it live for the person. So um, take your time over these descriptions because it is, as you've seen, with, with things like um, the complex STEM infographic or, or the um, cloud graphic, a lot of information there. So just take your time and, and work through the steps and, and you'll get a fantastic description at the end of it. Um, so describing infographics, um, the description of an infographic tends to need to reference the following elements. Um, so as, as Valerie said, this is kind of areas that we've covered, um, is the title of the infographic and talk about the structure of the infographic, um, the number of sections. Infographics are so um, widespread and popular now um, and they're fantastic for, for for conveying a lot of information in a in a kind of snapshot, um, but divide it up into sections because a lot of infographics, you know, they're four eight sections and, and tell the user um, the number of sections up front so they they're aware and they can visualise as they work through the infographic description. Um, talk about the images and diagrams incorporated into the design, um, but make sure that you don't actually um, include decorative images. A lot of infographics include images that you don't need to describe everything. So if it's got a pie chart, yes, you need that data. But if it's got a nice picture of a book because um, they're talking about 100% of people read books or something, um, you don't necessarily need that decorative book image. Um, so talk about the information provided in each section um, and repeat the text contained within the image. Um, very often the case that that image will just be an image. It's not readable from, by the screen reader. So you need to extract that text from the image. And that can be fairly straightforward. If you've got PDF, you can um, you use OCR on that and you can pull out that data. So you're not typing everything out um, each time. Um, as I say, only describe the relevant images um, and number each list element within a section to help the user to keep track of where they are. So they can jump back and forward to think, oh, I'm in section two, um, and this has got a list of, of four, four elements and they and know exactly where they are. So you don't get lost, especially with, with large description. So for instance, this is an infographic of infographics. And this is all the information that people convey in, in infographics. So um, it's divided into uh, 10 sections. Um, so immediately you're, 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 you're visualizing or creating that structure, that framework for the user. So there's a design section on the left and a content section in the, on the right. And then it's got sections underneath it, five sections within or subsections within each section. So um, it's quite a lot of information here. So um, you kind of start off and then provide a structural, the overview, as Valerie's been talking about that overview introduction, then talk about the structure, and then you go into the detail. So you move from kind of scene setting to storytelling. So that storytelling is the details. You end up with a massive great description like this one. I'm not gonna read the whole thing out because I think everyone would leave. Um, but it's, again, we've got that overview, um, at the start, an infographic entitled Infographics of Infographics. 
Um, the introduction reads as follows. Um, there was a, an introduction briefly at the top. So you include that, you take the text out of that and, and include that in the description right up front. So that's the author's introduction. So you follow their, their lead. Um, again, the graphic is divided into two main sections, design on the left, content on the right. Each main section is further subdivided into five sections. The sections and subsections are as follows. And then you're basically creating a list. Lists are your friend. Um, they organize things um, and they provide a structure which is easily um, relatable by the human beings. We, we like creating lists. Of, of, of things, favorite you know, albums or whatever. It's, uh, um, we, we enjoy lists. It helps us um, understand information in an easier way. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you can see there that each section is divided basically up into a list and you provide the data points related to that. Again, it is the, the description continued. So you can see there's a lot of information there. Um, and you're, you're providing it in a structured way um, to convey all that information to the, to the end user. So describing choropleths, um, a choropleth map is, uh, displays quantitative values for distinct definable spatial regions on a map. Um, the description for a choropleth map needs to reference the following data, basically the title of the map, um, again, the structure of the map and, and the map being used. The text key to the colouring used to measure the data. Um, colouring is important for these types of maps, mainly because like, we, we can look at a bar chart which is done in different uh, colours. It's not necessarily that useful. You can still understand it from the data points. Um, but in a choropleth map, um, the colouring can be very, very important indeed. So you need to convey uh, the colours uh, and provide a key uh, to the user. Um, the measurement scale, if there is one available, uh, you can provide trend analysis um, with examples if, if possible, especially if it's a, got a huge amount of data, if it's kind of a mass data um, uh, image. Um, you're not going to provide every single data point, but you can provide trend analysis. Um, and as I say, um, choropleth maps use colours to define or prioritise information and should be translated into text, mainly because if um, a, a non-sighted user is, is um, working in a peer group, uh, they need to be able to say, oh, the blue colours on this map or the red colours, so everyone can relate to the same thing. Here is an example. I'm sure many of you have, have seen a, a graphic like this in the, the previous couple of weeks. Um, so this is uh, titled State of the Nation. It's a cross map of the election results from the US presidential election in November. Um, this kind of gets banded around on the internet quite a lot because um, the US is very good for creating these types of maps because of the state system. So the description would be for this, Biden won, and that's all you'd need to say. Um, not really. Um, the description would be a map is color-coded to reflect the winning party in each state with blue representing Democrats and red representing the Republicans. A horizontal bar chart positioned above the map illustrates the overall result with Democratic nominee Joe Biden receiving 306 votes and incumbent Republican president Donald Trump receiving 232. The results for each state are presented in the following table. The states listed alphabetically, again, you're creating that structure um, and, and allowing the user to visualize what they're kind of, um, the content and information they're gonna receive, um, are presented in column one, the winning party is listed in column two, and the number of electoral college votes for each state are presented in column three. Split electoral college votes in Maine and Nebraska are represented by two rows for the respective votes. That's included because uh, the user might get to the point in, in the table where Maine has been included twice and they'd be like, what's happening here? Um, but it's just because of the way they, they do their electoral college votes. So you end up with the data are as follows. And you just have a table, um, uh, three columns, um, whatever it would be, 52 rows, because District of Columbia is included in here and they've got header um, row as well. Um, and then you have all the data and, and the user can move through that table and discover who won in each state, which party and how many electoral votes were um, voted for. 
So uh, going on to map, describing map, um, the following elements need to be referenced when describing um, a political map. We'll have the example in a moment. Um, the subject, the main subject of the map, that must be included in, in the brief description or the alt text. Um, the subject of a political map will be a global continental country or regional um, effect. So then we're talking about the date. Uh, when was that map created? Because that's always quite important if, you, if, if that's provided in the information you have. Um, emphasis and context, the map has been selected for a reason and the context and usage of the map should be addressed in the description. Um, include things like places of interest, uh, things like main cities, um, usually main cities are included, especially capitals, um, seas and rivers, and mountain ranges, anything like that. Um, it's not necessary to list every place of interest, but it does provide a certain amount of detail that creates immersion and just interest in, in the description. Um, I like to include edge boundaries. Um, it's not applicable to every map, but sometimes when you you have a map and it's focused on a particular area, and I'll show you an actual next example actually. See, um, the map here is um, a map of Europe, but it has around the edges, uh, Russia's on the right, um, North Africa is at the bottom. So I'd like to create edge boundaries to just to uh, in, increase that um, visualization. Uh, aspect so you know that the North Atlantic Ocean is on the left to the east or to, sorry to the west um, and Russia is to the east and things like that so you're creating those boundaries and they're coming quite useful um, also with things like street map as well so if you've got um, uh, boundaries of, of certain streets at north south east and west it can create um, a framework with for the, for the user. Um, so to describe them as continued, colour, in most color cases colour is used to visually differentiate uh, between uh, countries, it's not generally necessary to include those colour details, if, if France is, uh, it was in this one, France is kind of a brown colour um, and the United Kingdom is orange, you don't really need to know that information, they've just done that to, to make it a little bit clearer, but that's not necessary for the description. Include things like the scale ratio and the scale measurements. Um, Talk about um, spatial description. Now um, we're going to go through the kind of sector uh, approach to to describing maps because it can be quite useful. So for, for this one of, of Europe, you can divide that into quadrants because um, there's a lot of information in a map. If you divide it into quadrants, you can deal with each quadrant separately. So you're creating sections um, and talking through them. So for the, for instance, this. One, it's a political map of Europe in 2012. The map shows each of the countries of Europe. The four quadrants of the map cover the following countries. So then you go through northwest, northeast, southeast, and southwest, listing out the countries um, in each sector. Then you talk, you're saying that each capital city has been included, um, major rivers are included as well, and then you're talking about the edge boundaries as, as at the end there to, to really frame that description. Going back to the sector um, of theory of, or, or method of, of describing um, these types of complex images, um, basically you're using <coughs> quadrants um, and this can, or, or a clock face or a compass. So you're describing the north, east, west and south of that image, or you're dividing that um, image into four parts, or it could be more than that if, if necessary, or you're dividing with particular um, uh, detailed uh, illustrations and, and diagrams, you can divide them into the clock face. So it gets 12 sectors. So you can say between 12 and one, this is what's happening. And between one and two, this is what's happening. So that can be quite useful for very, um, of complex and detailed uh, paintings and artworks for instance but it can be applied to, to maps and all kinds of things so on the, the left here we've got a, a, a two-page illustration from uh, Neil Gaiman's Stardust there's a huge amount ha happening in this kind of marketplace scene so you can use the kind of clock face approach and divide it into 12 sections so you can really get the richness and detail that the author is trying to convey and on the right hand side we have uh, the Flemish marketplace I think um, by Bruegel, uh, which is again is a, got a huge amount of detail. Lots of great things happening in this. If you you can actually go on this in um, the Google.org Arts Gallery, and um, you can get into detail. You can actually see all the faces. It's so detailed the way they've actually uh, replicated it. But you can create a, a quadrant effect there, so you can div divide it into sections. Talk about the the upper left section, the upper right, and go through and, and really break it down in an easier way. 
So this slide is entitled The UK Divided. It's a, um, a map of the UK um, regarding the, the kind of geology of the UK. Um, and you can divide this because of the nature of the UK. You can divide it into sectors, um, but one on top of each other. So you're working down through from north to south. And so you end up with a description saying a geological map of the UK and Ireland, the map plots the geological makeup of the United Kingdom and Ireland and uses colour to define the geological properties of the regions. A colour-coded key for sedimentary rocks reads as follows, and then you can provide the colour key, and then you can break the map down into six distinct regions. So you go from Scotland to Northern England to the Midlands, Southern England, Wales, um, and Northern Ireland to the bottom. And, and then you have, can have a note at the end if you want, um, saying the rock formations in Scotland and match Northern Ireland and the rock formations in Wales match those in Southern Ireland. Just an interesting point. You can see where um, Ireland divided off from the UK, but it has the same kind of geology. So just to recap, um, think about structure, organize as lists. Um, lists are really your friend, um, especially with things like uh, bar charts, pie charts. You think about where that pie chart or bar chart came from. It was originally a, a spreadsheet um, document and it was created from that. It was translated into a pie chart. So basically what you're doing is translating it back. Um, present things as tables. It really helps uh, create um, or helps independence for the user. If you provide all that data and they can explore it themselves. Um, make sure to subdivide um, into sections for things like infographics. It just breaks it down that huge amount of data that's been provided in infographic. You can break it down into an easily consumable way. Um, and as Valerie says, uh, talk about um, use a pathway and go from um, an overview to the details. You're moving from the general to the specific. Visualization, um, always start with that overview or that focus point and move through the description um, using a pathway through all the details or that's using the structure at the start and then providing that kind of storytelling aspect um, with the details uh, and providing that kind of immersive aspect. And then you end up with a fantastic final description. Let's see control quickly. At the end, always uh, think about stepping into the user's shoes. Are you providing all the information that they would want? If a sighted reader looked at this, um, uh, at this diagram, you get all the information quite quickly, bang, 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 those are the trends I need. Um, are you doing that? Are you repeating that in, in, in the description to enable um, a visually impaired user to get exactly that same information? and try to recreate the image um, from the description. It's always such a useful exercise. If you're not sure, if read your description back and see if you can actually recreate the image from the, just the description without looking at the image um, and see how well you've done. It's always a, a useful exercise. So I hope that's really kind of helped uh, kind of unravel the complexity of, of complex images. I know it's a really, well, by nature, complex business. Um, but we, we hope that that gives you kind of an overview and a starting point to, to think about um, describing complex images and, and creating that kind of level playing field for, for all users. We, as we say, we, we realize that it is quite a, a complex field. So as I said at the start, we are doing a trilogy of these talks. So we're very much open to um, your thoughts um, about what we should cover in the next session. So I think at this point we're going to be um, asking Dave to take control. Well, here we go, a poll um, and I'll move on my screen. Back, there we go. Um, and Valerie, did you want to take over? Sure. Um, great, great presentation, Hugh. Um, okay. So we are looking to get your feedback and your um, input into what we cover in our next webinar on alt text description and we're interested in learning about what kinds of images you would like to be covered in a future webinar um, and so we have some ideas for what we haven't covered yet that we were thinking of including and so those are available choices and i'll list them out artwork graphic novels and cartoons anatomy and physiology textbooks or images, tests and how to describe an image without giving away the answer if the student is going to be tested on that, um, or other. And please respond in the Q&A if you have other examples that you'd like to see us cover next time. 
Thank you so much, Valerie and Hugh. We've got time for some questions while people are voting. Uh, good mix of questions in, in here. And as Alice says already, that was an awesome presentation. Thank you, uh, both of you. So quite a practical question from Kiersey here, which is um, maybe related to one that, well, you both talked about bar graphs, for example, bar charts. If you're listing values in an image, um, do you repeat the units or are you specific about the units of measurement after each number, like uh, kilometers and so on? How do you handle that so that it's both clear and, and yet not repetitive? That's a good question. In terms of uh, generally, if I'm using tables, um, I would include the measurement in the table header and then just the number in the table um, in the in the row, as it were. So you're, you're not creating that. Um, especially if there's a lot of data points, it, it, it does create that kind of repetition, which is a bit uh, kind of boring, basically. Um, if, if there's only a, a few um, um, examples, data points, and you're not using a table, I would just list them out. And, and generally, after that, I would put kilometers or whatever it might be. And I generally also write them out as well, just in case screen readers stumble over KM or whatever it might be. I tend to write things out. Um, so write out the word kilometers just, just to make sure. I agree 100%. I would make sure that in, especially if you have meters per second, if you have a slash or forward mm -hmm. slash or um, something, I would just type it out in words, meters per PER second. Thank you for that. Uh, Sue asks a question, it's really a clarification because you've talked about alt text and um, Valerie, you were talking about what's available within JAWS and you kind of hear that all in one go. Could you help Sue with some clarification around what's better to or appropriate to include in the alt text field uh, versus in an extended description, which maybe is navigable. And how practically do you include that extended description? I guess that second part of the question relates to, well, exactly what is the document? What format is it in and how will it be read? So that distinction, please, between alt text and the extended description. Uh, so Valerie, are you able to start with that? I am, and it's a really hard question. It, it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the type of material you are describing and your audience. So um, working at CIDI, a lot of the decisions that we made are based on what the student prefers. So the student um, through their disability service provider is asking us for either brief description or long description. And we have different products that we provide uh, based on those preferences. And um, so a lot of students prefer the brief description. Um, and but in other cases, the student will say, no, I want more comprehensive detail and all images described in every data point. And so that's how we are making our decisions. I would say as a rule, you don't want to go beyond three or four sentences of alt text description um, on any image because that uh, depending on the person's settings in JAWS or NVDA or whatever technology they're using, it could get cut off. You have the option that, you know, maybe they have chosen brief description. They don't have their settings on verbose description. Um, and so you run the risk of someone not hearing all of that hard work that you're doing. Um, so I would say three or four sentences, five maximum. And then you want to think about moving that information out of the alt text into uh, the body of the document. Got it. And Hugh, in some of the examples you gave, mm -hmm. where you had nested lists and tables and so on. So clearly that's not alt text. You don't have the benefit of knowing the preferences of the end users because you're doing this work, as I understand it, mostly with publishers. So what's your yeah. take on this and how are you including those definitely so um as, as valerie says it's, it's it's a short brief description no more than kind of three or four sentences um 
generally it works out with, with things like graphs. Um, it's quite a brief alt text, so it could even be one or two sentences. With uh, a photograph, you can generally get most information that you need into, into the alt text, so that's fine, so it can be a little bit longer. But as you say, I work mainly with publishers, so um, it's generally working with the EPUB format, and I think this is probably a nice segue into um, into a session that you've got coming up in terms of, of actually implementing um, alt text and, and image descriptions and those long image descriptions into EPUB because EPUB really handles it quite well. Um, as you say, like you can't use lists and things like that in, in alt text, it just won't work or bullet pointed lists, those kind of things, nested, nested tables. Um, but it does handle that really well as in, in, in EPUB. So the majority of publishers that I work with are using tables um, and lists as long descriptions within EPUB. So it, it keeps things simpler for me. Um, I'm not kind of, as you say, not dealing directly with the, with the end user, but um, the EPUB format really does provide a, an excellent way uh, of kind of delineating between alt text and, and providing that opportunity to to have long descriptions which have all that kind of information in, have that way of conveying information through lists and through tables which can um, be independently um, examined by the, by the reader. Um, so EPUB, um, I think you've got, as I say, I think you've got a session coming up quite soon um, and that'll be fascinating to see because it's always developing um, with, with long descriptions um, and the way they're, they're handled. Great. Well, I'll mention that session in just a moment, but maybe you could just reassure Ulrikas, uh, who has this question. You're working with publishers, so they're not considering these uh, image descriptions and extended descriptions as a corruption of their material from the publisher's point of view. This was her question. As, uh, is, there a, is there a question from the publishers uh, on, on that side of things? A corruption. That's that, so I, I'm kind of my my work is a corrupting uh, influence. I like that. Um, I like that a lot. I like that. <laughs> um, it's a good point, though. It's a really good point because um, uh, the the author is conveying information, so you have to be very impartial. You're not saying um, I don't put descriptions in saying like Biden won, of course. Um, it, you're always being impartial. You're talking. You're looking at the context of, of the work around it. Um, you're providing a very neutral description this is the information being conveyed in that image you're not um, kind of making an, an interpretation of that image if there are any um, instances where I'm not sure what the author is trying to portray or there's um, uh, perhaps an error um, some of the books I've worked on they've got hundreds and hundreds of graphs in so sometimes you, you come across an error in the data um, and you work with the publisher you go back and say um, look I found this or I'm not sure about this and then I even I've even worked with the authors themselves because the um, the publisher's not sure so we, we create that kind of um, that kind of pathway between between me and, and the author so I always want to make sure that the the author's story is being told in the correct way so I won't uh, kind of go in and say oh this is what I, I I think so you have to be very impartial um, and at the end of the day it's the author's work and the publisher is paying me to, to describe it so um, hopefully I'm not corrupting it but I do like the idea of it. Thank you for that Hugh and uh, uh, so th and thank you also for mentioning that uh, we will be having a webinar that we'll be announcing uh, shortly which will cover the technical detail of how extended descriptions can be included including some latest published uh, best practice examples and maybe indeed we can include some of the images and descriptions that we featured in this webinar uh, as examples uh, kind of shown working within uh, EPUB uh, there so that'll be exciting to see. Uh, the results of the poll are out and we see that, for example, Yasmita, who asked a question but didn't have a chance to get it answered, the most commonly requested one is for uh, images that relate to tests and testing scenarios without giving away the answer. So we'll be sure to feature that and the uh, others that are covered in the poll results. For so thank you for those, we'll be analysing those. We're coming to the end of this session. So thank you again to Valerie and Hugh for sharing great information and insights. Next week, we will be featuring Kiersey from Finland as our host uh, for the session, Do More with Word to EPUB. 
point and shoot and you can start making accessible EPUBs with Microsoft Word and Word to EPUB by Daisy. But you can do a lot more than simply click and follow through. This session will demonstrate the very latest version of the tool. It'll introduce you to the newest features and give you a taste of what's coming soon. You can register at daisy.org forward slash webinars, where you can also sign up to the webinar announcements mailing list. If you'd like to suggest a subject for a future webinar, uh, or if you're considering presenting a webinar yourself, then please email us at webinars at daisy.org. Well, I hope you'll join us again next week. In the meantime, thank you for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye.